then we'll have a special number. it isn't uh, applause worthy. I know that uh, that song ministers, doesn't it? God is worthy, isn't he? And he's worthy of our worship and our praise. And you know, uh, we call this hour our Sunday morning service, our worship service. The word worship actually has four different words that it's uh, translated from in the scripture. And every single one of those words ultimately means to bow. Uh, there are many aspects in a church service, like praise, and like the preaching aspect, and those words uh, are not synonyms for worship. The word worship means to bow before, to fall down before, and in its pure sense, in its strictest sense, no church has worshipped unless we've taken time to bow before God, and so we take very seriously the call to worship in our service, and this morning I'd like to just have a moment. Some folks may not physically be able to bow this morning. And if you're not physically able to, we have a Father in Heaven that knows your heart and that is bowing before Him. But we need to take a moment and just acknowledge God that He is our supreme being and that He is worthy of our worship. And so let's take a moment of silence and let's just really open our worship service this morning by bowing before the Lord, shall we? This will be our last week to be looking at the seven churches in Revelation. And you may have noticed as we have looked through the, this portion of the Scriptures we've been preaching about the seven churches in Revelation, and we focus more on what the Scripture says than what can be known about these churches uh, extra-biblically. And by extra-biblically, I don't mean unbiblically. I'm just talking about things that can be known about the cities. Many times when you're preaching and 
uh, uh, for instance, about as we're going to be in Laodicea today, people will talk about the uh, just the topographic graphical aspects of Laodicea, the fact that the water there uh, would have been above ground and it would have been uh, kind of warm. And uh, I've heard messages preached about lukewarm water and how that uh, being lukewarm, uh, you know, the water is disgusting to the taste. That does ignore uh, un-American culture. Uh, ever thought about that? Uh, you know, Americans, as far as I know, are the only culture that likes ice water. We, we drink our water cold. Uh, most other places, if you go to Europe or other countries, uh, they usually like their water room temperature. And so lukewarm <laughs> uh, preaching, lu lukewarm preaching isn't so hot uh, in other cultures, actually, if you think about it. We don't want to Americanize the scripture. God isn't an American. I say many times, God's not American, but I am. He made me an American. I'm happy and, and uh, grateful uh, for my heritage, but I'm not going to Americanize the word of God. Cultures come, cultures go, and uh, I'm really thankful for a nation that actually uh, was established by God's blessing. And there's just no other way to explain uh, the existence of our nation. God has done uh, supernatural things in our country. America is not in the Bible, uh, but this church at Laodicea is. And so I want to just preach what the Word of God says. You may notice about that. Another thing uh, that is interesting, and I, I, I would encourage you to study out, look at, for your own uh, for your own benefit would be the parallels between each description of each church the parallels uh, between church history history like periods in church history and uh, the uncanny uh, coincidences if you'll call them that uh, that parallel time periods and certainly times and generations do have tendencies don't they yesterday uh, Anthony and I were having a fun discussion. You know, I'm old, uh, and I'm, I'm really thankful to be in, a, in an audience where some of you all, when I say I'm old, would say, no, sir, you're not, you young whippersnapper. Thank you for thinking that, if that's what you're thinking right now. I appreciate it. But uh, you know, I'm old in the eyes of our young people, like our teenagers. And yesterday, I was, uh, we were talking about 80s, the 1980s culture. And Anthony was saying, well, what, did, what, did, what was the 80s like? So yesterday I Google searched and uh, found him a picture of a bowl haircut. Remember the bowl haircut from the 1980s where they, you know. Andrew, did you have a bowl haircut? I probably did grow it up. <laughs> you probably did. <laughs> this, this man probably did. Uh, but a bowl haircut, that kind of happened somewhat in the 90s. But it, it was started in the 80s. And it looked like they put a bowl around some people's head and just shaved the sides off. And, and then the mullet. I remember the mullets. You know, in the 1980s, where you have the long hair kind of, but it's not long, long hair, but you know, just the kind of hang you down tail on the end of your hair in the back. And uh, then we looked at neon colors. We looked at the, you remember we used to call it hot pink and uh, neon green. And I mean, we all wore the brightest oranges and pinks and greens in the 1980s. And then leisure suits. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and then, the kids, a lot of them, wore the, uh, well, they looked like pajama pants. Did you know the baggy pants? And uh, so anyway, we were looking at 80s culture. And one of the th thoughts that I have when you look at periods of time is that, there's, that periods of time do actually have characteristics or tendencies. Generations have characteristics or tendencies. Uh, several folks in here will be part of the baby boomer generation. And you'd know what some of your, yeah, I know who you are. Uh, you'd know <laughs> what some of your generational tendencies or characteristics are. I would be on the end of the Gen Xers. And I, I was telling Anthony yesterday, he said, you know, what, what are some Gen X tender tendencies? I said, well, uh, we're analytical and we're disrespectful. You know, uh, it's, we're very, very, we don't, we don't just believe what people say. Gen Xers don't. We definitely... Uh, have no problem just rejecting or accepting on the basis of our choice, whatever. A Gen X, that's a Gen X tendency. Millennials uh, tend to be very open-minded, uh, so open-minded that you know they'll believe this and they'll believe something that contradicts it, like you know this this way or that way or whatever. They'll accept anything. Uh, Gen Xers tend to not accept anything, and so you can look at generational tendencies and time periods, and you can actually see parallels. And I think it is. Uh, a noted, notable study, but again, 
when we study the scripture, we won't want to look at uh, just principles or ideas behind the text. We want to look at what is actually being written and said. So we have not studied the churches as church ages because they are specific geographical locations of actual churches that were being written to by the Holy Spirit of God. And that's as the scripture is written here. And so now we will go to verse uh, 14 and read to the end of the chapter in Revelation chapter 3. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, <clears throat> because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in, the, in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Let's say the last verse together. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Father, in this room, each of us have ears. Help us to have ears to hear what you say to this church. For Jesus' sake we ask this. Amen. Well, this church at Laodicea is one where I, growing up, oftentimes heard, we're in the last days, we are in the Laodicean age. How many of y'all ever heard that? We are in the Laodicean age. And uh, my entire lifetime, I've, I've heard that. And uh, how many of you believe that, by the way? How many, I, I, think, I think we're, you know, the characteristics of the Laodicean church are characteristic of the church at large in the United States of America. But there are a couple of considerations that you and I ought to make before we wholeheartedly subscribe uh, to that notion or before we take the Scripture and, and attribute this church and say, well, this is the church today. And by I think the church today, we're going to say the church at large. In other words, that church which is, you know, everybody but us. We're the only good church out there, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm being facetious about that. You know that, right? I am not an us for no more. I believe that there are many people around the world, more people than we know, that love the Lord and are serving Him with all their heart. And I would just think of, of uh, Elijah, and uh, he, I think he would have said, we're in the Laodicean age. I'm the only one alive who loves God. And God said, no, you're not, Elijah. There are more than 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. And uh, 7,000 may not seem like so many, but there are millions. There are millions of believers around the, Lord, around the world that love God. You say, well, pastor, nobody loves God like they should. Would you like to compare yourself in, with that statement? Do you love God like you should, like you ought to? Uh, does God have everything that He ought to have from you? Well, you say, uh, most of the time, some of the time, yeah, all the time is what I'm asking because uh, I think if you were to grant yourself some of the time that you love God, like you do, or, or like you should, or most of the time that you love God like you should, uh, or a majority of the time that you love God like you should, then I think you ought to give someone else the benefit of the same doubt that you give yourself for that. We ought to love God all the time, shouldn't we? Amen. We ought to live for God all our lives, oughtn't we? And uh, the reality of it is, is that uh, one of the misnomers, though, with the statement that we're in the Laodicean age is first of all the phrase, the last days. Do a New Testament study sometime and you'll see the Apostle Paul believing and uh, knowing 
that he was in the last days. Amen. He was living in the last days. We've been in the last days for a long time. Before this letter about the seven churches was ever written, we were living in the last days. See, there's nothing that needs to be accomplished for the Lord Jesus to come and to take us. You may be living for the things of this life, my friend. You may not even have this life to live. Not just because uh, you could die at any moment, but because the Lord Jesus may come in the clouds and call up the saints to be with Him forever. And you and I are in the last days. There's nothing left before the Lord Jesus comes. And uh, things the Bible says are going to wax worse and worse. Well, they uh, certainly are. But do a little bit of a historical check before you say things are worse than they've ever been before. Do it just a little check. Sometime read contemporaneous literature uh, with the first century church and you will find culture that shocks our culture, like cultural norms that are shocking in our culture, which has uh, crossed barriers of cultural norms in the, in the last, well, every, every decade we seem to just, just uh, go past what would have been barriers 10 years before in culture. And yet, uh, sin's not new, my friend. <laughs> the devil uh, has not been born lately. and He wasn't born yesterday, and, and he's been up to his tricks for a long while. Now, having said all of that, uh, <clears throat> there are in each church... Oh, the, the, second, the second thing. Okay, it's the first thing I was going to say about the, 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 the caution was saying we're living only or exclusively in the Laodicean age is... First, that we've always been in the last days. So to try and say, well, this century versus this century is Laodicean, now that's a little bit dangerous. The second thing we have to be careful about is that if we're living in the Laodicean age, then scrap the other six letters. Tear them out of your Bible. Because they must not fit with the, all Scripture is given for, by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so that's a little problem uh, with that perspective theologically. There's more to it uh, than what we're discussing here uh, this morning. But I want to look at the reprimands that the Holy Spirit, literally Jesus Himself, gives to a church that He indicates in the letter that He greatly loves. Okay, first of all, uh, He says the same thing to the church at Laodicea, which He said to the other churches, I know, I know, I know that works. I know what's going on. So many times you and I seem to, at least in our minds, or sometimes we verbalize, uh, the notion that God doesn't know what's going on. You ever thought that, you know, if God knew what was going on in society, but if God just knew how wicked things are, if God just knew what that person did, if God, my friend, God knows. I know God says. I, some years ago, was shaken by the reality that if God dealt with evil, I would be included in those who are dealt with. You say, Pastor, what have, I, have you done? Well, less than you have probably. I'm being silly about that, but the reality of it is, is if God destroyed evildoers, this fellow couldn't stand. Right. And nor could you. The fact is God's merciful has been merciful. It's part of his part of his being as a God. And it is such such a beautiful attribute that a God who is so righteous that he cannot allow any sin to go unjudged to love sinners and to judge his perfect son so that sinners could be justified. What a wonderful truth. What a wonderful God He is. And so here, Jesus is writing to a church. doesn't really have anything at all good to say about them at all. There's just nothing good uh, that Jesus mentions about the church at Laodicea. Uh, <laughs> I haven't told this in a while, but if, if you've heard it from me before, I'm sorry, you know, uh, pastors regurgitate stories. But when I lived in Pensacola down, street, down the street, not far from where I lived, on Jackson, I lived on Green Street, but we, Jackson Street would have been the street right above ours. If you went down Jackson Street, there was a little church, and it had on the sign, a hand-painted sign that said, First Corinthian Baptist Church. First Corinthian Baptist Church. And I thought, these folks have never read the first letter to Corinthians. <laughs> or, they're the most honest church uh, there ever was. And maybe that's you know their little corner on uh, 
the, the market or whatever is that, hey, we're just as wicked as we can be. We lack unity. And uh, so if you want to be part of that, come join us. <laughs> because the church at Corinth, the first letter to the church at Corinth in the Scripture is all rebuke. I mean, every bit of it is, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. It was just a mess. And God still loved that church, but it was a mess. And so I'd be as likely to name a church the first church of Laodicea or Laodicean Baptist Church as I would the first Corinthian church because God didn't have anything good to say about that church. You read the letters to the other six churches and God says, I know, and I know the good, and you tell them what the good was. And he'd say, I know this, and you tell them what the evil was, and then give them a uh, give them uh, marching orders. This is what you're supposed to do about what I've said. And so uh, this church, though, Jesus just says, I know. I know that works. Here's what I think of your works. They're neither cold nor hot, and I, I wish they were one or the other. Now, why is it that Jesus would say, I wish they're one or the other? It is not because lukewarm is such a disgusting temperature. Now, I'm just going to confess some things to you. The first time I ever enjoyed coffee was lukewarm. When I was a, a kid, I just remember, you know, going to work with my dad, and he had coffee that he hadn't drank, and uh, it was in the truck, I think, sitting on the dash. We didn't have cup holders when I was growing up. But, uh, you know, I was sitting on the dash of his 19, I think it was 76 Chevy pickup, and I remember just tasting his coffee, and it was pretty good. Before that, when I tasted coffee, it was hot, and it burned my tongue. And uh, I didn't enjoy it uh, for being hot, but he, my dad, had, you know, he'd seasoned up his coffee pretty well with some uh, plenty of cream and sugar. And uh, lukewarm, it was pretty good. Lukewarm coffee's pretty good. Uh, I don't mind coffee that's lukewarm. I don't, I'm not a person that has to have it piping hot. I don't know what's so wonderful about burning your tongue or the roof of your mouth. I, I, that's not something I do. You hot coffee people, I think that there's maybe, uh, this is what, this is my impression of you. You know, you've got to have it burning hot. I just think that you think there's something tough about a guy burning his mouth and you're showing off. That's the only reason you like it. It doesn't taste better hot. Now, hot food tastes good, doesn't it? Or cold food tastes good. It's kind of one of those, you know, neither in the, in the middle. But that isn't the point of what Jesus is saying. Jesus is just simply saying you're lukewarm. You're not hot, you're not cold. And you know, it's kind of disgusting when you can't identify someone. Isn't it? You ever just, you know, just relieved to find out where someone's at? Even with uh, their politics or what they believe spiritually or religiously? <laughs> Last week, I found... On, uh, I found on a, a classified ad, I found a shed I was looking at for an office for our church. It was already built out as an office. A guy had purchased a house and he wanted to get rid of it. And so I was going to look and see if that would maybe work. And it turned out that the way it was listed wasn't accurate, not because the man was dishonest, but because he guessed at dimensions and so forth. And so what he was asking wasn't reasonable for what it actually was. And so I, I told him I'd do some research on it, and I texted him later, and and uh, I just had this, I enjoyed this guy, I liked his personality. And uh, he sent me a text, he said, well, make me an offer. And I said, well, I don't want to insult you. I said, we're just so far apart on the offer. I said, I just think that if I were to make you an offer, uh, then uh, I, I, might be, I might be insulting to you. So he sent me back a funny text that said something like, I'm not a snowflake, yada, 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 and mentioned his politics in the middle of it. Make me an offer if you want to, it won't hurt my feelings. And so I did, and I haven't heard from him since I made the offer. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> the reality of it, though, is that, um, you know, I just want to know what somebody is, right? I just want to know what the deal is. You know, you, uh, we, might, we might be the same, we might be different, but I don't like, I don't want you to be pretending to be like me if you're not, and you don't want me to be pretending to be like you if, if, you, if I'm not. You understand what I'm saying? I don't like sneaky people. I just don't like people that pretend and act like they're something when they're not what they are. And that's what the church at Laodicea was like. It's very, very evident here that they are very much like the world and uh, that they also were very much like the church. And they were just kind of, meh. You know, neither. Uh, <clears throat> when I was a teenager, I remember a, a, a young preacher coming and preaching about how that when he was a teenager, he said he called himself a jellyfish. And he preached a sermon, uh, the story of the jellyfish. 
And he just talked about how that he basically just kind of took whatever shape of whoever he was around. If he was with the Christian kids and he was around the uh, preachers and the teachers of the Christian school and so forth, then he was a great Christian kid. But then uh, if he was around the kids that are worldly and they were doing worldly things, he was just like them and he was just whatever he is with. And you know, as a teenager, I remember uh, going places with my dad and meeting adults that I said, I, that in my mind I thought they're jellyfishes. I seen them in church. I heard them talk in church. I see what they present themselves as as church, in church. And now I hear them. And I see them at work. And I see what they present themselves as at work. And for some people, it seemed like that was normal. They had their church face and they had their uh, during the week face. You know, this is the way they are at work and this is the way they are at church. And they're not the same. And uh, I think that's Laodicean, don't you? This church of Laodicea is full of people uh, that on the one hand are hot and on the other hand they're cold. But they're really not either because they're not hot or cold. They, they, you, you know, if you ask the person, why would someone go to church and act like they love God? Let me ask you the question. You ever been just a little bit less than genuine? Why would you go to church and act like you're a great Christian, like you love God? Now, give, you can give me the negative aspect of it, but let me tell you the honest truth. At some place in your life, there's a little bit of conviction that you ought to love God, and you're acting on it. Isn't it so? In other words, I don't, I don't assume uh, that everybody that comes in the church house who isn't a perfect Christian is just fake. I think they realize they ought to be a good Christian. And they're kind of trying. <laughs> and then, the same person, uh, during the week, they're with lost people or they're with saved people that, that aren't hot for, and aren't, aren't on fire to serve the Lord. And uh, they kind of want to be like them too. And they're just pulled. They're, yeah. I, you know, I'm around these people, I want, to be with the, I want to be a good Christian. And when I'm around these people, I want to be right around, around I, want to, I don't want to be a good Christian. I want to be kind of worldly. And I just want to be both. Listen to me. I see this with teenagers all the time. Teenagers, look at, look at me. We've got a lot of teenagers here. Aren't you thankful that we have so much of the now in our church? Our teenagers are not our future. They're the now. They're the present. And I'm so thankful. I had 10 teens in my Sunday school this morning, and I've got some of the best teenagers in this church. I call them mine because, you know, they're not mine. They belong to the Lord. But I'm, I'm just really, really thrilled to have so many good young people. And they are the now. Uh, but uh, teenagers, you listen to me. You stop trying to please people. You figure out who you ought to please and forget everything else. Just figure out, I want to please God and just forget everything else. Sometimes I'll meet teenagers and I realize that whoever they're with is what they're like. They're, we call them pleasers. My wife, has, that's the nice name. She says, she'll, she'll say, well, she's a pleaser. Or, well, he's a pleaser. Which means that if they're around good friends, they do good things. If they're bad, around bad friends, they do bad things. Same kid. And... Uh, I always just tell you something, pleasers will do anything. They'll do anything, and they're the ones that really get messed up worse than the people that don't even want to do good things. Because they'll just do anything to please. You'll wreck your life if you try to please, if you try to serve two masters and you try to please the wrong one. And uh, I'd urge you, I'd urge you now generation, I've already named the next generation, I'm calling them the now generation. You young people, you live for God now. And when you find something in the Word of God and you discover that it's true and it's right and it's good and it's what God wants, you just stand for it. And don't stand for anything but it. You stand up in the now. You go to your schools and you'll see, if you'll ever stand, you'll see hordes of people around there just looking for someone that'll be the now. To stand now. That generation. I say, you know, I'm going to do right. I remember the first time that really I turned the corner on this matter that, that, that God's dealing with the church at Laodicea with. And I remember being with a couple of my peers. I would have been in my late teens. I remember being with a couple of people my same age who when I stood, they got right in line. And I remember having a friend say, thanks for standing. I was hoping someone would. And that's what we need. We need some of you. You're some of the best teenagers around. You may look in the mirror and say, well, I don't see anything to be impressed by well, I'm going to tell you something. God can take you, and God can do some incredible things with you if you'll just take some things that God says and let God do them in you. And there will be people, <laughs> there will be people, well, they don't know that you're just a regular person. And they won't be able to know it because God's doing things with you that are better, that are greater than what you can do. 
And so you stand for Jesus. Don't be glad to see Him. Don't be eh, cold, eh, hot, back and forth. And that's this church. Man, I get confused by these churches. Man, sometimes I go in a church or I'll meet a pastor and I'll talk to him and say, man, this man loves the Lord. And then I'll get into church and I'll see some compromises. And I'll say, man, this guy doesn't love the Lord. And I'll just be confused. On the one hand, he says this and does this. On the other hand, he does this. I've heard of, of uh, churches that have strong stands in one area and then I see some other area and I'm just like, well, that's really inconsistent. <laughs> that just doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah, you, know, you stand for this, but you won't stand for that. Cole, I can't figure out what you are. But just go ahead and be hot. Just go ahead and be what you're supposed to be, not something in the middle. Now, now notice a couple more things here in the Scripture. Here's what they said. I am rich, verse 17, and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now hear me, this is hard for us to relate to because of a worldview that we've bought into. But listen to me for just a second. No one in the United States of America could exclude themselves from the statement, I am rich. We do not even have legitimate poverty in the United States of America. Now let me qualify that statement before somebody, somebody checks out on me just a minute. There are individuals that are helpless because of abusive situations in the United States. In other words, I'll tell you, it's not too bad in, in Fort Lauderdale compared to uh, where I grew up in Salina, in Salina, Kansas. Salina, Kansas in the Midwest, you know, it's kind of wholesome, a lot of Christians in the area. You know, a majority of people would uh, claim to be born again, believe in God, and that sort of thing. I grew up in Salina, Kansas, and doing bus ministry and that sort of thing, and my, my dad still does, and my mom still works with kids. I'm telling you, I've been in homes that are absolute hovels. I mean, places, places where they're not fit to live in. Just not fit to live in. And it's tragic, it's sad, because you see children living in those places. But then you do a little investigation and you recognize, you know, the parents get money. They use it for drugs. They sell the food stamps uh, to buy drugs or alcohol or what. I mean, literally, they, they have the means, but people that are helpless to do anything about it are in a bad situation because of I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the standard of how any American can live. Anyone in the United States of America can live in such a way that a majority of the world would say you're rich. And that's a fact. And so if ever anyone would have to be careful about being real about it, be honest about it, say I'm rich. You say, Pastor, most people don't think they're, they're doing very well. I was in Home Depot the other day and this lazy woman who wouldn't help anybody was half helping me make some keys. And Everybody kept coming up her, to her and asking help, and she said, you have to wait to them. She wouldn't try to help or try to get someone to help or anything like that. And in conversation, I don't know why there's tape on my pulpit, but moving that's distracting me. Uh, and while, while we were in conversation, I told her, I said, you know, this good economy has really got Home Depot busy. Oh, the economy is good? It's a good economy? I said, yes, it is. It's a fantastic economy. I wanted to say, you shouldn't even be hired in any economy, but you still got a job. That's how good the economy is. You know, but I uh, didn't. Uh, it's, uh, that's what I felt like saying. But the fact of the matter is, a woman has a job. A job with some benefits, and she's full-time. And uh, But she'd say, I'm not rich. The economy's terrible. I don't get paid enough. She wasn't worth $2, and she's probably making 10 You know, whatever it is. I'm serious. She's lazy. Uh, and the reality of it is, is that a lot of people would say, I'm not rich. But when I knock on a door, and I say, can I tell you? Can I tell you about eternal life? People will say, I'm not interested. And you know, if I knock on a door in a country where people don't have anything, they're interested in anything that I can give them or that'll help them. <clears throat> One of our problems in the United States of America is that we're rich. You know, most people aren't interested until something happens. You know, you know the most interested audience you'll ever find is a group of people at a funeral. I'll tell you, I'd rather preach, I'd rather preach at a funeral than anywhere else. I've seen more people come to Jesus at funerals. I'll never pass up the opportunity to preach the gospel at a funeral because it's one of the few places where people are rich. 
The reality of eternity grips people when they're faced with it. The deathbed in a hospital is a place where people, a lot of times, the only time in their life have got time. Why is it people are too busy, they don't have time, or they're not interested? I'll tell you why. Because they're rich. That's why. I have need of nothing. In other words, I don't need God. I've had people tell me things like, you know, God's never done anything for me. I don't need anything from God. The Bible says it rains on the just as well as the unjust. <laughs> Everything you have came from God. And the mo there will come a moment when you realize it. Man, I don't know how many people I've met, you've probably also met, had everything, lost everything. When they lost everything, one of the things they realized was, man, anybody could lose everything. Anybody could lose everything they have. You could lose your health. You could lose your mind. That's the most frightening to me, losing my mind. It's just it's a terrifying thing when you realize, you know what, I had a lapse somewhere. I don't know what happened, but it's some, there's a part of my brain that's missing. And it's scary. It's frightening. See, Pastor, you experienced that? I don't remember. But, really. <laughs> Uh, the fact is, is that that's a, you can lose it. When you lose your mind, and you just can't even think, you can't even remember. All of a sudden, you're not so rich. You just, uh, you know, I, I got this. I can. You, you realize I can't handle anything. I am, I'm not even sure who I am or where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to be doing. You lose your mind. Lose your ability. Man, I'll tell you, being strong and capable. One of the hardest things in the world is to be less strong, less capable. The first time you try to break something, and you break instead. And you realize, uh-oh, it's not the same as it used to be. And you start realizing, okay, you know what? Uh, I'll be honest with you. You know, I've been in, in uh, situations where, you know, I'm just not much of a victim. You know, you, you think about, I'm going to mug somebody. People are like, you know, I think I'll mug that guy. You know, but day's coming for me. Day's coming. You know, you, you're strong. You'll someday be weak. And uh, you'll, be, you'll be vulnerable. You'll be less help. help uh, you'll have less help than you think. You'd be helpless. You know, we live in a society, we live in a church age when we think we've got it. People need us, we don't need them. And uh, this is a church, Laodicea, that fits that description. I have need of nothing. I'm increased with goods. I've got everything. I'm good. I'm good. You're ready to say, I'm good. I've tried to knock on the door, try to hand somebody a gospel track, and they say, I'm good. <laughs> you know? You're not going to come back with the, there's none that doeth good. There's nobody that's good, is there? Listen, if you, want to, you want to diagnose the problem with the church at Laodicea, it was that they did not need Jesus. They needed Him enough to be born again, but to live with Jesus, to, to, to need Him on a daily basis and to have a dependency on God. You know something? I'll tell you something, friend. We'd be better off not to be rich so we could depend on God. See, to have a God who can supply your needs. You, you listen, you don't depend on God. You can be rich and depend on God. <laughs> but most rich people don't depend on God. And you and I need to look at this rebuke to the church at Laodicea and say, you know what, I don't want to be like this. Verse 18, here's, here's the counsel. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. Now, there are several allusions that we could cross-reference here. One would be in uh, 1 Corinthians when the Bible talks about works. The works that a person does being either gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. And when the works are tried by fire, the fire burns the wood, hay, and stubble, and only the things that have value last, the gold, silver, and precious stones. You know, we're living lives and we think we've got you know, the world by the tail. And we think we've got a hold of everything and we're riding the wave. But the fact of the matter is is that most of what people think is success and they think God is so thrilled by isn't. You can go to an average church, and I'm saying average church, and uh, I'll tell you what, if their facilities are good in good order, they think it's an indication of their spiritual, of their spiritual condition. And it isn't. You think if a church doesn't have a good bank account or nice facilities that maybe they're not doing so well. Maybe God's not so pleased. It's amazing what we call success in the church today. You go to a church success seminar where they try to tell you how to build a successful church and they'll talk about networking, they'll talk about 
uh, about reaching the maximum amount of people, and they'll never mention how people are doing in their relationship with the Lord. They, they'll govern or determine success on the basis of numbers and on the basis of worldly influence. And what they mean by success is we've got a lot of business people in our church, or we've got a lot of finances, or we've got a, uh, we've got a nice building, or we've got this, or we've got that. And I'm going to tell you something, those stuff all burns in the fire. Those things all burn in the fire. What matters are things that are spiritual and that are eternal. And this church of Laodicea didn't have that. They had everything. They looked good. They looked impressive. You go there, you'd say, this is some church. And God said, they're neither cold nor hot. He said, I counsel thee, buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. My friend, if you can't figure out, if you haven't in your life figured out what God calls rich and what God calls success, you better take some time and devote to finding out what greatness, what success, what richness is in God's eyes. If you have it in your eyes and God doesn't agree with you, you're poor. That's what the Scripture says. Then he says, Anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. You're blind over your condition. Verse 19 is a reminder, and it's a beautiful, loving reminder. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Isn't it marvelous that a church that Jesus has nothing good to say about, he reminds him the reason I'm talking to you is because I love you. It reminds me of Romans 5.8. That's becoming another one of my favorite verses. When we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Why does God love me? Because I'm ungodly. What is it about me that attracts God? There's nothing about me that attracts God. It's His character. It's the fact that He just loves unlovely, ungodly things. And you know, I can rest in that. If I have a bad day, I don't have to wonder whether or not God loves me. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? And the same is true of this church at Laodicea. God said, I don't like anything about you, but I love you. And that's the reason I'm talking to you. Listen, the Holy Spirit of God's here today. You may feel the rebuke. But coupled with the rebuke is a reminder that a God in heaven who ought to just destroy the wicked is condescending to urge you to turn to Him in repentance. And that's love. God wants you. God wants you. You, you hear me this morning? Do you understand what I'm saying? God loves you and God wants you to turn to Him. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a lovely truth about our God? You may not be what you're supposed to be. You may have failed God in every way. Uh, you may be as ungodly as can be. You may be Laodicean to the core, neither hot nor cold. But God wants you. And God loves you. Man, I'll tell you, out of the entire letters to the churches, that rings and resonates in my heart more than any of the other truths. Because God loves me. God wants me. God loves you. And God wants you. And He wants you to turn. He wants you to have not cold, not hot. He wants you to turn, to repent, and to, to be what you're supposed to be. And then the invitation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I remember being three years old and hearing this verse read and uh, seeing a picture in a Bible book of that my parents were reading to me and showed it. I can sort of vaguely remember the image. It was uh, someone in a white robe uh, knocking on a door. you know. And I remember my dad telling the story about how that Jesus is knocking on a door and, and he just wants to come in. If anybody opens, he'll come in and uh, sup with Him and He with me. I'm reminded of how consistent that is with the ministry of the Lord Jesus. As the Lord Jesus is talking here, remember what they always used to say about Jesus? He eats with sinners. Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sup with you. I'm going to dine with you in your house today. Hey, Anthony, Charlie, Stacy, Andrew, everybody here. You open the door and I'll come in. You let me in. And I'll sup with you now, sitting at the table with Jesus. Amen. Sitting at a table with Jesus and dining with Jesus. Jesus wants a meal with you. He wants to fellowship with you. Here's a Laodicean church that's so not caught, not, not caught, not hot, not cold. I've been taking mixing words 
together. I, I wish someone would record them so I could write my own dictionary. But they're not hot, not cold. And Jesus said, I, you let me in. We'll warm things up. I'll come in. I want to stand at the door and knock. I've had people say, well, that's the door of your heart. You know, I'm fine with that. It's the door of the church here in Laodicea. Jesus said, I'm outside the church. I'm not an insider in your church. Listen to me. Listen now. You know, we, 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 we talk, we say Jesus a lot of times. But really fellowshipping around Jesus. How much of that happens in the church house? You know, Jesus is an outsider in most churches. Jesus is out, outside the church. Everybody's in there uh, having it their way. People are in the church house and man, they are, they're, they're worshiping with their music and they're giving their motivational speeches and they're vibing and, and they are relating to their culture and they're gathered all around them. This is a church with an experience that's tailored to you. Not a church that's about Jesus. Tailored around Jesus. Man, my friend, we can become all about us, can't we? All about what's going on in our lives. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not diminishing or minimizing the importance of your life. You matter to Jesus. You're important. But friend, who's the preeminent person in the church? I mean, who's it all about? A church ought to be like, let's try to be like Jesus. Let's try to make this service. If we're going to worship God, let's make this all about God. Let's make this all about Jesus. We don't want Him to be out there. We want Him to be in here. And He said, you open the door, I'll, get, I'll come in. I'm knocking. I'd like to be there. I'd like to meet with you. Do you hear that? Do you hear what Jesus is saying? I'd like to be there. I'd like to meet with you. I'd like to be involved in what you're doing over there. I'll come into Him, we'll sup with Him, and He with me. Jesus said, you know what? You can be the exception. You don't have to be the norm to Him that overcometh. I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in His throne. You say, Pastor, what in the world does that mean? Well, more than I can imagine. First of all, I can't imagine being in the presence of God. Seeing, seeing God face to face is something that is, is right at, at this stage in my life, it's dreadful to me, to be honest with you. Face to face. A couple weeks ago in Sunday school, we, with the teenagers, we looked at how that Moses talked to God like a friend, face to face. I mean, just had that, you know, just like a friend. That's what Jesus is talking about here. We're going to be in heaven someday with God in His throne, Jesus in, his, in God's throne, and us in Jesus' throne. And I don't even know what that's going to be, a big throne. Uh, and here we're all going to be in there and, and just with Jesus, just like we're one with God. That's an incredible promise. It's an incredible privilege, one that I don't deserve. God's telling this church that just doesn't have any good characteristics about it at all. He's saying, here's, how, here's what I want, here's what I desire, and here's what you can have. And then we conclude with the same conclusion we've seen each week. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith on the churches. So let's finish today with, with that same checkup. Shall we? You want to just check real quick and see if you've got an ear? Got one? Is it there? Still on? You probably didn't have time to look in the mirror this morning from the looks of most of y'all. But uh, <laughs> might as well finish with an insult today. Uh, uh, you know... You got an ear? Jesus said, well, I'm talking to you. Let him hear. You listen to me, Jesus said. What the Spirit said in the churches. Did you hear it this morning? I got a couple things out of this text that really, that really resonated and stood out with me. The first one is, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The reason we get rebuked from Jesus is because He loves us. That's wonderful, isn't it? That's consistent with many other verses in the Scripture about chasing and rebuke. If you're rebuked here this morning, you say, you know, we came, I mean, I just got rebuked. Well, that's a good sign of what? Jesus loves you. Yeah, and the second one was this, man, Jesus wants to come in. I want to, I want to be there. I want to be part. I want to sup with you. I want you to sup with me. I want fellowship with you. Jesus wants fellowship with me. It's the second thing. And then 
uh, the last one was, man, we're going to be part of this whole overcoming if we respond to the message the way that Jesus wants us to. How are you going to respond this morning? To him that overcome, if I'll grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and Sam sat down with my Father in his throne. Friend, listen to that. Do you hear it? Jesus wants you to be part of fellowship with him face to face for eternity. How can you say no? Let's not be Laodicean. You know, I'm not concerned with whether or not this is the Laodicean church age. I'm concerned with whether or not this man is Laodicean. I'm concerned with whether or not this church, the church that I'm part of, Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, is Laodicean. We don't want to be hot or cold. Let's be hot. Let's let Jesus come in. Father, thank You. Thank You for the simplicity of the message today. Thank You for the conclusion of it. And Lord, we're touched by Your devotion to individuals who are wholly undevoted to You. You are so gracious. You love sinners. You love us. And there's left no doubt of that in our text today. Help us as a church, God, to respond to Your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't feel this morning as usual to uh, led to have a invitation. I think that the invitation has been responded to. You know, a lot of times when I sit under preaching, when God says something, I just say, that's true, yes, and it's, it's done in my heart. And I pray that that would be true for you here today. We're going to dismiss our services now, and I uh, want to invite you to be back again tonight as we're in the pastoral epistles. And we'll have a little ice cream fellowship afterwards celebrate Jamancy and Starge's birthdays. You're dismissed. Have a great day.